So, uh, very good afternoon to everyone. My name is Hari. I'm a Python enthusiast, which means that I don't work with Python every day on my uh, job, and I keep playing with Python. So I try to play with a lot of things in Python, learn whatever I can. Uh, a few of my experiments you can find on my on my page there on GitHub. I did a little bit of web development experiments recently, so if anyone wants to have a look at that, it's Django and Flask experiments on those. Uh, but let's get to the point of our of our session now, which is building a custom kernel for IPython. So all of us have heard about IPython. We have used it in many ways, probably. I first came across IPython when I attended PyCon Singapore in uh, 2013. And um, since then, I found that I use more Python from the command line now, because IPython makes it very easy to look up functions. Uh, it also provides auto-completion and everything. So once I worked with IPython, I wanted to know how it works. And recently, after they announced the project would split into a separate kernel and a kind of core as part of uh, the reorganization, I thought, why not try to build a kernel? So this talk will be about how you can build a kernel, right? So why build a kernel? So like I said, PyPython is very very simple and easy to use, a, a tool which provides a lot of magic, and it is very useful for Python programming. Now, you would feel very happy if you had something like that for every language. You, if you had a REPL for every language where it would provide you auto-completion, give you um, hints and everything, let you reload code, it would be very fun. But we, we don't have that for all the languages. And sometimes you might work with maybe SQL, maybe work with Redis, and you might think, maybe if I had something like IPython, it might make my life a, a little bit more easy here. So if there's something out there, you can use it. But if not, we're all programmers. We could easily uh, build something in a few minutes which works. And then if it works very well, we might make a project out of it. And if not any of these, it's always fun to look at something break it apart, how it works internally, figure that out, and then put it back together with maybe your own modifications and all this stuff. It's what we all do as programmers, and it's, it's just an extension of that. So with that, let's understand how, uh, how IPython works. So let's say you, you have Python installed, and you start up a Python shell. That is a shell. It is a Python. Uh, it is an instance of the Python interpreter. You're passing in commands to that. It is executing them and printing out the output. So it's just a single process, right? You won't be able to connect into that shell from anywhere else unless you open it in a particular way, maybe. But unlike that, when you open an IPython session, that is actually a client and a shell running in the background. So it's a kernel and a client. So you have more than one process. So you have a, a, a simple REPL built on read line. You have the IPython uh, interface built on that. You have a Python execution, which is the Python interpreter. And surprisingly, the Python kernel uh, on, on which the IPython shell is running it also connects to 0MQ and exposes some sockets where it's publishing messages. So if you open an IPython session and you, and you write a function, that function, that code, if it has any side effect, that is being exposed on these messages. So if you think about it, that means that once you have a, a IPython shell running somewhere, whatever you do, you're able to broadcast your uh, side effects of your code, or maybe the, or, uh, maybe the output of your code, and send it to anybody who wants to subscribe to that. 
If you wanted to build a logging mechanism, you wanted to audit everything, you could build something which subscribes to 0MQ and writes it into a file. That's possible. So with that architecture in mind, this means that when you open IPython and you open the shell, that's one client. If you open a Qt client, that's again the same thing, which is connecting, one of, which is connecting to a process of IPython interpreter, uh, which is a Python interpreter running in the background. So you could have one kernel and you could connect all your clients into that. And that is how the web interface works. If you use the IPython notebook, which is a very magical piece of software, you can do anything in there. You can plot images, you can do everything in the web as if it was a shell. So what it is doing is you have a kernel running somewhere. You have the notebook server running, which exposes the web server where you open the notebook. And what is happening in the browser is it just sends commands to the notebook server, which passes on to the kernel using uh, the messaging format over 0MQ. The kernel executes it, returns it back. That's why if you look at an IPython web notebook, you can see that you can have multiple kernels in there. And if you restart your kernel, you actually get a message saying kernel is not available. That is because the notebook was trying to communicate with the kernel, and you restarted it, and it says, OK, I can't find it anymore. They want me to shut down the notebook or whatever, right? So this is the architecture. So when I say we will build a kernel, we'll build that little last box, which is the kernel. And we'll make it communicate with everything else using 0MQ, right? Now, with the reorganization into the uh, Jupyter project, you can have uh, kernels built in multiple ways. Like I said, a kernel is nothing but a process which exposes a shell or which exposes a way of executing a command in an application or a language and communicates over 0MQ. So if you're writing a kernel for, for let's say, Scala, which can access the 0MQ libraries of uh, which, which is built for Scala, then you can build a full-fledged application in, in that which opens all the ports required and sends or responds to the messages. But if you don't want to do that, you could even build a wrapper kernel. So we'll, be, we'll see what wrapper kernel is in, um, in a few minutes, but Essentially, a wrapper kernel is something which makes use of IPython code to start up the kernel, set up the channels, and manage the uh, publish and subscribe of the 0MQ messages for you. You don't have to worry about that. right? So there will be two types of kernels. And we'll see more in detail on the wrapper kernels. So this is just an overview of how messaging happens. If you have an IPython kernel and you have a bunch of front ends connecting to that, you have a lot of sockets and you send a lot of messages on that. So all these front ends which you have, A, B, C, connecting to the same kernel will be seeing the same values. So you set a value from kernel A, modify it in kernel B, you can see the value in kernel C. So, uh, not, not kernel, sorry. You set a value from front end A, which you can modify it from front end B, and you can see the side effect even in front end C. Right? OK. So I said all the front ends speak to the kernel using a messaging spec. So if you go to the IPython website, you will find more information on the messaging spec there. It is basically uh, JSON messages, which are human readable, except maybe the hashes and all those things in there. Um, and there is a format for that. You have a bunch of messages, like an execute request. You have a history request. You, you have a bunch of control messages. And um, all these 
have their own formats, but more importantly, all these are sent or received on four sockets. That's all. Four sockets are important. One, the most important one is the socket which is called as the shell socket. Right? This is where you send a request for execution. So each time you open IPython front end, you write your code and you hit control enter or you hit enter, whatever it is. That code gets sent on the shell socket. The kernel executes it and you get back a response back on the shell. This is a request reply kind of a channel. The other one is the IOPUB. This is where the kernel broadcasts the side effects. So if you have any client which is interested in picking up the side effects, or maybe if you're doing parallel processing, you want to get the side effects on something in, in one of the other kernels, you could use this. Now, sometimes you'll write some code which expects the user to enter something. So the client, whether it's the web notebook or the, or the REPL or the Qt client, you can send that input and the kernel will request it on the STD ion socket. And uh, last but not the least, we have the control, which is, uh, this is for messages which are supposed to take higher priority over the execution. So let's say I send an infinite loop and the kernel is hung. I want to shut it down. Then that message is sent to the control channel and it shuts down the kernel, right? So this is at a high level messaging spec. Now, this information is required when we build a kernel. So this is roughly how a message looks like. You see the header, which is, which is important because um, that is you should track the messages. You will have the parent information like it is so that the kernel has to know which client is sending this message and all that. There's a metadata and at last actual content of the message. This is either execute request or the response from the shell, uh, I mean, from the kernel on the shell socket and all that stuff, right? So this is a basic message. Now, I mentioned we either have a full kernel written in that language or you have a wrapper kernel. So full kernel is for languages. Uh, if you want to write for maybe Scala, maybe C++, C Sharp, then you just have to um, write your own uh, boilerplate code for 0MQ, make sure, make sure you start those four sockets. You have enough information to parse the messaging spec, you understand what are the fields in that, and then you can simply respond to that. There is an example of this from the IPython uh, uh, folks, which is, which is a simple kernel. It's actually in, uh, I think it's written in Python, and it just um, starts a bunch of for zero MQ channels in Python. But on their website, you have a bunch of other examples like a Haskell kernel, which has been written in Haskell. If you know that, or if I think you'll find other examples which you can look at. Wrapper kernels, uh, these ones, like I mentioned, these make use of the machinery within IPython. So you don't have to worry about the sockets. You don't have to worry about formatting the messages. All you need is you will get an entry point where you get your code. You execute that on whatever language or, or application that you're building the kernel for. And once that is done, you send back a response. So a very simple example for this is a bash kernel, which is also from the IPython folks. So to, if you think about wrapper kernel, this is a, for situations where you want to write a kernel for an application which probably exposes a Python API. Uh, I will be showing you an example for a Redis kernel. I could have written the kernel that write a wrapper kernel. My kernel code uses Redis API to call it to Redis, get the values, and show it. And maybe you want to start something as a child process and interact with it using maybe uh, something like a pre-expect. You could start a, a child process of something and interact with it. So you could do that, right? So our focus for, for remaining 15, 20 minutes or whatever it is, 
will be on building wrapper kernels. So, right? Before I show you some code, some basic fundamentals. Uh, wrapper kernels have to extend from a IPython class to get all the uh, all the functionality. That is that class is called kernel. It's part it's part of ipython.kernel.zmq kernel base. I think in uh, Jupyter this will get moved to another place. I, I still haven't looked at it. So keep that in mind. This provides all the all the scaffolding which you need and you can just build a kernel on that. So there are some basic main properties which you need to implement. So if you look at the uh, messaging messaging kernel info uh, link which I have there, um, you can see that um, all these fields are mentioned there. What is the purpose of all of them? These are things which are used to show the message when you open the client, when you open the REPL, and all those things. Um, and the entire kernel can be built in one method, which is execute. This gets your code, and it gets whether you're supposed to send back the output or not, which is silent, and a bunch of other things, whether you should record history, whether you have user exp expressions, or whether you require STDIN in that. So that's the only method which you need to write. And with that, you can build a kernel. Right? And once you have built a kernel, how do you launch it? You have a kernel. You have a kernel application. It is called IP kernel app in IPython uh, uh, 3.x. And um, you can use that to launch the kernel. This you can put it in your main method. Or if you're running your kernel as a module with a minus m, write an underscore main and put it in that. And it will work. Right? Now, let's see some code. OK? So what we're going to do is um, I will start with some simple examples, which I created a few minutes back. Um, and then we'll see a Redis kernel um, and see how you can write all the additional functionality like, like the, uh, managing the history and everything. So, uh, so the code for a disk kernel is, av is available on my page there, GitHub. And um, if you want to know more about the signatures of um, all the IPython um, wrapper kernel functions, it is there in that page. Now, this might change with um, Jupyter, so please bear that in mind. Okay. So that. So if you go to the IPython API and you look at this page, IPython uh, developer guide, you'll find all the pages here. Messaging spec, kernels, wrapper kernels, and all the other information here. And if you want to look at Redis kernel code, it is available on my on my GitHub here. Uh, you can install it from PyPy uh, from uh, pip, and uh, yep, it it should be easy to use. Now let's see some examples. It's okay. Sorry. Okay. So I said you. You just need to write one, one method if you want to implement a kernel. So this is a simple echo kernel. It is not doing anything. I just import the kernel, extend the kernel, set all these important variables which are required by the kernel so that it can start it up. I just write the execute method. Now, pin the execute. now. Before we get to execute, all these are just properties. You're not really doing anything here. You're not executing or returning anything. Right? Now, if you go down, and this is where you see the first execution. So, you got your code. I just want to echo the code. I'm just assigning it to my variable. In your kernel, you would just go and execute it somewhere. And once you have the output of that, you store it in whatever you want to 
send back to the client. And if you get the silent as false, which, which means you have to return the output, somebody is expecting it, then you need to create an output which is of this format. It's a simple structure. You just mention the source. Where is it coming from? It is coming from the kernel. Now, in this case, I've just put it as kernel. But maybe if you want, you might want to put in the uh, something like, like an instance ID of the kernel. So if you have multiple kernels, you know which one is sending back the output. And then you send back the result. Now, the result can be sent in multiple formats. If it's just the normal command line tool, you send back plain, plain ASCII characters, fine. It will just show it there. But if you're using it in a web notebook, you must have noticed that whenever you use IPython web notebook, things like pandas, they, f they format the output. You can see that as a uh, very nicely formatted HTML there. That is where you can send the HTML output. So if you have a, something like a result set, and you want to show that as HTML with some CSS, you can put that in HTML, and, and you can send it back. And it will be shown on clients which, which uh, support HTML. And once you have a structure which you want to send out, all you need to do is self.send response. You don't have to worry about sockets. You don't have to worry about anything. Just send it out, and it will appear. And no matter what you do, whether you are sending back a response or not, you need to inform the client that the kernel has either completed or it has not completed. So usually, if you have any error, you would want to return it with uh, output here so that it gets uh, shown. And you would just return something like this, saying kernel finished. Nothing to do here. Waiting for the next one. right? And then you just put the main method. So now. Let's just simply try to run this. I'm just running the kernel. And if you see, once the kernel runs, it is not opening a shell, because I'm just running a kernel. I'm not starting a client. It says that I'm, I'm starting a kernel. This is the kernel ID. What does that mean? It is pointing you to a file. It is not even giving you a port number. So let's see what is in that file. I I forgot where it is. Anyway, so anyway, so. I'll see if I can find this information before the end of this session. But what it's actually doing is it is writing a file, a JSON file, and it puts the port numbers of the uh, 0MQ sessions in that file. So um, if you want to start an IPython console, you have to point it to this kernel. So you would simply do IPython console and point it to that kernel. And now, oh, sorry, Python console. And now you can see that it 
just a second. I could swear this was working 15 minutes before this session, but something broke. But I will show that to you when I open Redis kernel or maybe my next example. Okay? Uh, right. So, I, as I mentioned, this is a simple kernel where you're just echoing back what you want to do. Let's say you want to do something more funky than this. Um, I have another example which I am trying to control a node chase shell using IPython. So what I am doing here is, this is the example where I was uh, uh, saying you can write a wrapper kernel for something where you process, where you, where you uh, start a child process and you interact with it. So I am using a pexpect to start a simple uh, child process where I start node and each time I, I receive some code, I'll pass it on to that and I'll get back the result, right? So this is exactly the same thing. You execute, you send back the response, okay? So we'll see this in action in a few minutes. Um, I just want to quickly show you Redis kernel, which is uh, what I started when I uh, began uh, this exercise. So, this is a more complicated example which actually handles all the cases which um, are required for a wrapper kernel. So it has the usual setting up Redis on a host port and all that logic, all language information and everything. Now what we are trying to do here is each time you get code, I'm, I've actually opened a socket connection Redis and I'm passing Redis command over socket and I read back response from Redis. I'm not using any kind of API. So it connects Redis and it executes the command, it uh, gets back response and it sends it back, right? And I'm also recording the history. So what you would do is normal execution, you receive the command, you execute it, you send back an error if you're not connected with uh, the Redis instance, you store the history and you execute it, you take the result and you send it back. It's the same thing which you've been seeing all along. Now we, we have other functions like if you have a, a, a special uh, logic which you want to execute while you're doing a shutdown, then you can write the shutdown method which is also part of the API and you can handle your shutdown logic here. I'm shutting down the socket connection with Redis. You could do anything. Um, now, sometimes in, in Python, when we write code and we are not finished on that line, like if we are writing an if condition on REPL, then it goes to the next line and we, we finish the code until we are finished. And then we hit enter. So if your language for which you're writing an IPython kernel has something like that, you need to write this method where you look at the code, you and you figure out whether it's a complete piece of code which can be executed or not. If it's a complete piece of code which can be executed, you return true. In this case, because it's simply a Redis command, it's always on one line, or in most of the cases. So I'm just returning true. You would have to inspect your code and you need to return the value here. And then you have another function called, uh, uh, oh, oh. okay. Just in case there's some confusion, this is for asking whether that piece of code is complete or not. This function is for providing autocomplete solutions. You're asking it to complete the code. So for the, for the complete method, um, you'll get the code and you'll get the cursor position. So if there's a command that it is called set, and there are multiple options of set. So if I just write on the shell, if I just write set, when I hit 
got a complete key, then what we'll get in the kernel is the code as set, and we'll get the cursor position as three. That is from where you need to finish the code. So you would look at this, you would look at all the commands, find the command, and then you will pass the command back. So cursor start, I'm actually passing back zero. So I want the shell to completely overwrite the command. If you don't want that, you can pass the cursor position, and then it'll overwrite from there. So this will give you auto suggest. And similarly, you have history. Now, this history is not the history which you see on Ripple. So the IPython console, the uh, command line client itself, maintains a history of its own. But the kernel itself can maintain history. Each time the kernel comes up, it can start another unique session ID, and it can record all the commands which are executed in that session. So if you had a client which wants to go and ask the kernel, what are last 100 commands executed on this? You can get it in this session, or the previous session, or anything. You can write it here. And you can do the history as the last 100 commands, which is a or you could do a, a, a range of commands, um, or you could do a search that all commands which have this trigger expression in that. So you could build it based on any of those. And you can search internally whichever way you want. You just return back a simple map of history with list of all the commands. Now if you notice, um, only, the, only the execution uh, method has to send back a response explicitly. You are doing self.send response on the IOPUB socket. Here's everything. You are sending that because the IOPUB socket is where you broadcast the output or the execution results to all the clients. Everything else, you simply return a value. You return the status. You return is complete. You return where the command has to be completed. You return the history. These are all managed by the wrapper kernels. And if you write your own kernel, you would have to handle all this formatting that message. So it's more headache if you write your own kernel. Right? So let's see this in action. I'm sure this one will work, unlike the other ones. So I need to bring up my readers. Just starting my Redis kernel. Okay, so I am starting this as a module. What is wrong with this? Ah, sorry. Confusion with the folder names. I have more than one folder with the same name. So I've started a Redis kernel, and I'm going to connect an IPython console. To that, this opens a proper IPython console. So now you see the familiar IPython prompt. The IPython console 3.1, that is from, from IPython. So now I'm connected with my Redis instance. So what would you do normally on Redis? Try to get a value. Is it there? It seems I have a value for this. So this is executing command on uh, Redis instance via socket, reading back the response, and showing it to you. I'm doing set x equal to 5. There was, there was a syntax error. This syntax error is the message which I got back from Redis, and I'm just passing it here. I'm not really doing anything here. Um, and if I do set x5, that works fine. OK, that's the response from Redis. I get it back. I do a get. These are all the suggestions which I have. 
get, get bed, get trains, get set. So you can see everything here. Or if I do C, same thing, get. So if you notice, if I do the first alphabet and I do a tab, it has already completed with the first option. That's because in my response I said, replace it from position zero. If I do get and I hit completion, everything starts with that. And the first command is already there. So I person has it, I mean it has run out of options to complete, so it is not doing anything. Same thing, um, if you just do a tab without anything, blank string, I'm searching for everything. So it returns all the commands. So this is, this is very useful. But for Redis, you have to Redis CLI, so you'll probably use that. Now, the other thing I mentioned is using this um, from the web notebook, um, where I was talking about the HTML output. So let's see if we can do that. Um, If I still have the kernel, I'm starting a Python notebook. Okay, I won't run notebook with Redis, but I can start Redis kernel in my notebook. It's not a big deal. So, what I'm going? Okay, looks like all I already have a Redis kernel running here. So I have this. Um, and I hit shift enter, that, that gets executed. And I say set x equal to 5. This one, for the other shell, I was returning plain ASCII value. But for this, I am actually returning a formatted HTML value, which, which highlights the error. Uh, I could um, just do get. Now, here I won't be able to do auto completion, or would I? Yeah. I will be able to do auto completion. So it gets back a response from there and it shows it in this list. Tab with, obviously that does not work, but you have to put something and it sh shows you all the commands it gets back in a response. So as you can see, writing a wrapper kernel which interacts with um, any external application and provides the output required to show it in an IPython client, web client or shell, is very easy. It's only now up to your application and, and how complex it is and what functionality you want in that, that you can build a kernel for it easily. And it should be able to work with every client. So that's all I had. If you have any questions, If not, then thank you very much.